So uh, before I depart the subject of economics, um, I want to talk about a matter of interest, namely interest. Um, Georges have often tended to ignore the role of capital, uh, and I, I think to their detriment. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, it's it's out of a source of frustration that Marxists get taken more seriously than us. Uh, and it's, well, I think that you know, part of it is that Marxists are looking at the power of capital, which seems more obvious to people than the power of land. Um, you know, I always said, you know, since we don't have like feudalism anymore, people look at corporations and they say, oh, well, those are capitalists who are controlling us. And Georges will tend to say, well, no, no, look at all the land they own, look at all the rent they receive. But it's more than that. Like in addition to you know the rents that received, there is in fact a surplus value of capital. Um, but uh, what we need, what we sort of need to do, is actually see how that is related to land. So uh, let's go talk about interest right now. Uh, now, when when you uh, take a loan from a bank and they charge interest, uh, there are three components to that. Actually, there is. Uh, first, risk premium. You know how big are how how big of risk are you to lend to? Do they think that they're going to get their money back? Um, second, expected rise in prices. You know inflation. Uh, there, um, and then the third part is what's called real interest, or, you know, which is the return of capital. Uh, now, notice the first two parts of the equation actually yields no revenue to the bank. Uh, you know, risk premium is made to even out so that uh, you know those that are able to pay, you know, pay, you know, compensate for those that uh, you know fail to make their payments. But then expected rate of inflation. Well, well, if it's well, the the you know anticipating the rate of inflation basically means that uh, they're going to get the same amount amount of the same equivalent back in uh, money that's worth less. Um, so the one real aspect of, uh, of of that loan that they're really uh, making a profit on is real interest, which is the return of capital, which is also um, you know, by, by being the return of capital is also uh, the profit that uh, you know that businesses make. You know, um, well, it's that plus rent, which I mean also. I and mean, banks end up receiving some rent too by virtue of owning, you know, of holding land as assets. But anyway, um, so you know, where does this real interest come from? Well, uh, just like rent, it's a scarcity value. You know, if there was enough capital circulating, then uh, the marginal yields would be zero because it'd be so. Because because it'd be because uh, everyone had access to it, and so there would be no particular benefit from uh, from owning something that everyone else could get could access to. Um, which you know is the same for land. But notice that uh, unlike land, there is no natural scarcity of capital. I mean, sure, you know, some of them yeah you need raw materials to produce them, and some raw materials may be scarce, but you know, there's always substitutability, and you know, on the aggregate, looking at capital, even even though some forms of capital may require you know certain scarce resources to produce, and you know, capital at, at the aggregate level is, you know, there there's no natural limitation on it. You can produce as, it's it's basically a matter of how much you could produce. Um, so the fact that there is a scarcity value of capital means that there is an means that it's an artificial scarcity. And uh, that artificial artificial scarcity is based on the real scarcity of land. Um, there are a few ways in which uh, the influence of land limits capital. Uh, for thing, rent, um, the return of land dampens productivity because uh, landowners who receive a larger amount of rent uh, have an incentive to um, to keep their land unused or more commonly underused. Uh, used, kept out of its you know full productive capacity because they're getting this uh, free lunch. So it, it's a countervailing force against production. Uh, for another thing, it um, causes, because banks use um, use land as 
as part, as the assets they own, uh, it, it it ends up funding um, fixed capital and, and misallocating capital towards less labor intensive kinds of capital called, called fixed capital, um, and which ends up you know tying up liquidity and leading to recessions that I've talked about in previous videos. Um, yeah, and also fixed capital can be used to secure rent. Think about in the simplest case would be a fence. You, know, you build you build a fence around a vacant lot so that no one can get in. You know, I mean that's one application of labor one time uh, in order to prevent labor from taking place on there. So I mean yeah, that's the more extreme case, but you know, corporations in, in basically when you have uh, the larger the firm the more they're just sort of securing market power by by uh, blocking out other interests, and that's a lot. Of, most of that value they're getting is rent, though some of it is interest. Um, and so that even firms that don't own the land they work on, you know, firms that rent out office space, still they still receive a surplus value in the form of interest. Um, so what would land value taxation do this? Uh, well, I mean, um, it would unleash the forces of production by putting forcing land to its highest and best use, and moving um, production inward towards the you know center of cities where the most production can take place. Uh, it would also break up the larger firms who, as I said, receive a higher percentage of their income from rent, and yeah, therefore you know, reduce the size of firm down to smaller businesses. Um, yeah, and that that would happen in the more short run, uh, and then over the long run, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we'd also see a shift to from fixed circ to circulating capital, but we'd also, because of the mobilization of the forces of production, we would see that artificial scarcity of capital disappear as more and more gets produced, so that uh, you yeah, know, with each one that, that um, with each unit of, cap of fixed and circulating capital that gets produced. Uh, the marginal return that they yield their owner uh, falls eventually to zero, so that you know, capital becomes so abundant for everyone to have access to that uh, it yields no special benefit over others. I mean, you, you, it's I mean, obviously it, it's you're better off using capital than not using the capital. That but uh, you don't. Uh, you don't get any sort of scarcity value out of it uh, by virtue of having it while others don't have access to it. Uh, so, so, the, so the basically interest, real interest, uh, in, in this discussion falls to zero, which um, John Maynard Keynes actually predicted. He called it the euthanasia of the rentier. Uh, he, he, but he, he believed that it was just by having full employment through countercyclical cycles that that would happen. Whereas I'm saying we would actually need to tax the land and get rid of the rent first in order for the interest rates to fall to zero and get and achieve that result. So, you know, what would this uh, Brave New World look like with um, all the rent going to the public coffers and uh, interest rates uh, falling to zero? Um, well, uh, that means that well, one factor of production uh, land is um, essentially its, its benefits are nationalized so that uh, so no one yields a surplus value from that. Capital uh, is super abundant so that no one gets any special benefit from owning capital uh, uh, unless they actually use it by applying their own labor to it. So that means that all the returns of uh, production uh, go to labor. And um, as we approach that point, what we would see is a shift towards more worker ownership of the means of production, uh, you know, both in the form of self-employment and in worker co-ops, because yeah, you know, basically since you don't get any surplus value from owning from owning the uh, from owning capital, uh, you know, the one reason to own it is if you're going to work on it, and for larger firms uh, that means. Uh, you know, that, that it's kind of inconvenient for one person to work on a whole factory, so it makes sense for the workers collectively to own it uh, because they're, they're the ones that benefit from it through uh, the returns to labor. 
Um, and so the same goes for banks. You know, we would see a shift towards, uh, you know, um, community banking, uh, you know, credit unions, mutual banking. But basically, banks would become tools for the community to allocate capital to the businesses in um, within it, and uh, that. And, and so, um, basically, what we get we end up getting is a nonprofit economy. You know, profit in the you know, capitalist sense of the word would be sort of a thing of the past. It would, it would instead be in an economy of equal exchange. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, giving out of the goodness of your hearts. You'd still earn, you'd still earn a living. You'd still, uh, it would be, still be reciprocal. You, you work, you know, a certain amount and you get paid a certain amount. Um, which you may sound like socialism to a lot of people. And, in it, it is sort of, but it's a free market socialism, if you will. It's a you know, it accomplishes the goals of socialism through uh, means of the free market. And uh, note how this is accomplished. You know, we don't can uh, we don't confiscate the you know the capital from the capitalists as you know as Marxist schemes tend to do. Uh, you know, I mean, we confiscate the power of land through land by taxation. Because that actually um, has no negative effect on production. In fact, it unleashes the forces of production. It is only by unleashing those those productive forces uh, that the power of capital is diffused. Uh, so, I, so actually, you know, the capitalist um, simply by opening the floodgates of competition, their power is undone. And so that is why. Um, and there's a saying that there's uh, no bigger opponents of, uh, of free market competition than those ex expected to compete in it. So, anyway, I uh, thought I'd share that with you. Uh, but thanks for listening. Peace.